the prosperity that began in 1619 and the dream of a new Eden, of people peacefully coexisting under English law, was seriously threatened in March 1622. On Good Friday, some 30 nations of the Powhatan Confederacy, angered by English violation of land treaties, attacked without warning and attempted to drive the English back into the sea. Along the James River, the Indians killed 350 colonists. On the Bennett Plantation alone, 52 people died. Among the 12 who survived was a man named Antonio. Here's an individual that arrives as one of the first African Americans in the history of what became the United States. He does what almost no one in early Virginia managed to do, and that is live. Everyone is dying of disease, violence, and in a sense, he's lucky. He had been brought to the colony the year before to work tobacco along the James River. His name appeared in the 1625 Virginia census as Antonio a Negro. He was listed as a servant. He comes to Virginia, finds a society that is just developing. He's getting in on the ground floor, as it, as it were. Um, I don't know if he was able to immediately envision that there would be opportunities for him here that uh, weren't available elsewhere. I don't know that anyone could have foretold that. When Antonio arrived, the laws of Virginia did not as yet define racial slavery. They governed only the status of servants. At some point, Antonio changed his name to Anthony Johnson and married a Negro servant named Mary from a neighboring plantation. She bore him four children. By 1640, it is clear Anthony and Mary were no longer servants. They had acquired their own modest estate on Virginia's eastern shore. As Johnson prospered, as he obtained land and cattle, he also acquired dependent laborers. What made all of this society go was property. Your identity in the society was determined rather obviously by the amount of land, the amount of labor that you own. Anthony Johnson was enjoying privileges belonging to a free Englishman. He claimed five workers as head rights and expanded his property to 250 acres along the Pongateague Creek. At least some of his workers were white. By 1650, Anthony was one of 400 black people in Virginia out of a population of almost 19,000 settlers. In Northampton County, where Johnson lived, Nearly 20 African men and women were free, and 13 owned their own homes. As Anthony Johnson is accumulating property, it seems as though his situation is secure. You get a sense of this individual, this black man, being treated like any white planter, and his wife and daughters being treated like the wife of a planter. At an early moment, when men and women were sorting themselves out, when the rules, the etiquette of race, labor, were not so clear. At this moment, in one county, in Virginia, it was not foreordained that race relations would become what they did become. In 1640, the year Anthony Johnson purchased his first piece of land, three servants had run away from a Virginia plantation and headed for Maryland. Captured and returned to their owner, they were tried for breaking their contract. The said three servants shall receive the punishment of whipping and to have 30 stripes apiece. One called Victor, a Dutchman, the other a Scotchman called James Gregory, shall first serve out their times according to their indentures, and one whole year apiece after, and after that to serve the colony for three whole years apiece. 
The third being a Negro named John Punch shall serve his said master or his assigns for the time of his natural life. Jamestown Court Recorder. The time of his natural life. According to all the legal records that survive, no white servant in America ever received such a sentence. So what begins to happen in the 1640s is that those who are controlling the Virginia colony say to themselves, the fluidity that we've seen in the past, the fluidity that has allowed an Anthony Johnson to serve less than a life term, to acquire his own piece of ground, to develop a free status, is not something that we want to project as going further in the future. We want to close down that opportunity. We want to begin to show some distinctions. The English definition of who could be enslaved began to shift from non-Christian to non-white. For Anthony and other Africans in America, the idea of an equal chance in the colonies was now under attack. In 1641, Massachusetts became the first colony on the British American mainland to recognize slavery as a legal institution. Connecticut followed in 1650, Maryland in 1663, New York and New Jersey in 1664. Virginia legally recognized slavery in 1661, and a year later, a Virginia court decided that all children born in the colony would be free or slave according to the condition of the mother. In Virginia, slavery would be defined by race and perpetuated through heredity. Perhaps in the middle of the 17th century, if you were one of several thousand Africans living in Virginia, uh, you certainly knew that your children would would uh, be free, you might have that expectation. And to suddenly find themselves involved in lifelong servitude and then to realize that in fact their children might inherit the same status, that was a terrible blow. That was a terrible transformation. I looked in the east I looked in the West. I For the first 50 years of the colony, most of the unfree labor force had been European, but that was about to change. Word of the hard life in Virginia had gotten back to England, and the colonial government faced a growing shortage of servant labor. Also troubling the colony were the thousands of free men, most former indentured servants, who were unemployed and roaming the countryside. The problem they face is not only a decreasing supply of indentured servants, but they face this increasing problem of what to do with all these indentured servants once they live out their term. And a lot of them were surviving. They had to be given land. They had to be given their freedom dues. And one of those dues included even guns. And there was a lot of unrest in Virginia. In 1661, servants rebelled in York County. Two years later, Gloucester County authorities foiled a plot by nine servants to steal arms and ammunition and march on the seat of colonial government. In 1676, the unrest in Virginia exploded into civil war. An army of 500 free men, servants, and slaves rebelled against the colonial establishment's restriction on available lands. They attacked peaceful Indians, ransacked property, and burned Jamestown, sending the governor into hiding. This disorder that the indentured servant system had created made racial slavery to southern slaveholders much more attractive because what, what were black slaves now? Well, they were a permanent, dependent, labor force who could be could be defined as a people set apart they were racially set apart they were outsiders they were strangers 
and in many ways throughout the, the world with, with a couple possible exceptions slavery has taken root especially well when the people who are enslaved are defined as strangers as outsiders and can therefore be put into an inheritable permanent status of slavery I understand there are some slave ships expected into York River now every day. I desire you to buy me five or six slaves, whereof three or four to be boys, a man, and a woman. The boys from eight to seventeen or eighteen, the rest as young as you can procure them. William Fitzhugh, Virginia Planter, 1681. Few ships coming from Africa made the voyage beyond the Caribbean to sell their cargoes on the mainland of British America. In 1672, the King of England chartered the Royal African Company, encouraging it to expand the British slave trade. Shareholders included 15 English lords and 25 sheriffs, the Governor of Virginia, and John Locke, the philosopher of liberty. In its first 16 years, the company transported nearly 90,000 Africans to the Americas. In the last decade of the 17th century, it was possible to imagine that in a single year, the number of new Africans arriving would equal the total black population in the colony or close to it. These were men and women that had no sense of the world they were getting into, and they seemed two whites as very alien, foreign, unknowable. The Europeans look upon these people and they project an image on them. They project an identity and that identity is African. What that means is non-American. What that means is non-European. What that means is separation. All servants imported and brought into this country who are not Christian in their native land shall be counted and be slaves. If any slave resists his master correcting such slave and shall happen to be killed in such, it shall not be accounted felony. If any Negro shall absent himself from his master's service and lie hid and lurking, and if he shall resist any person employed to apprehend the said Negro, then it shall be lawful for such person to kill the said Negro. Virginia General Assembly, June 1680. We think about slavery as this complete package that just came to evil landowners, and it didn't happen that way. It happened one law at a time, one person at a time. And as landowners felt the need to control a different behavior, year after year, they added more laws until finally 1691, they passed the law that made it illegal to free a black slave unless they were leaving the colony. So by then, it was pretty much set that this was going to be a slave society. To move from indentured servitude to racial slavery means that they're setting their own history on a course where freedom is going to depend on slavery, where the political economy of a major portion of these colonies is going to depend on slavery, uh, where the freedom of some is going to depend on the bondage of others. It means that the American colonies, this jewel of the British Empire, is living this contradictory history now of a society that is increasingly rooted in a labor system that's human bondage, that's racial slavery. Anthony Johnson moved his family out of Virginia and north to Maryland. There he leased 300 acres he called Tony's Vineyard, 
On that farm, Anthony Johnson died. Back in Virginia, a jury decided that the land Anthony had left behind could be seized by the state because he was a Negro and by consequence, an alien. One wonders how Johnson would have viewed this changing world of Virginia. He lived a very long time. He survived and did quite well by the standards of the day, building up properties, hundreds, hundreds of acres and cattle. By the standards of the time, anyone would say he did quite well. There's no reason to believe, uh, as of, say, the 1670s, that the Johnson family is going to be squeezed out. Within a few years, Anthony's grandson, John, purchased another 44 acres and in memory of his grandfather's homeland, called the farm, Angola. By the time the end of the century came, Anthony Johnson's children and grandchildren may well have been fighting to stay free. Many free people were sold into slavery. No, they couldn't prove that they were free. They, they had no way of letting anybody know that they were free. So if a plantation owner came by and said, this is my slave and I want to sell him, you were sold. By the end of the century, nearly 58,000 people lived in the colony. 16,000 were listed as Negroes. In 1705, the Virginia Assembly passed laws clearly defining the distinction between a slave and a servant, relegating all slaves to the status of real estate. The next year, John, the third generation of Johnsons in America, died without an heir. That would be the last mention of the plantation named for Anthony's birthplace. Angola Plantation, like the Johnsons themselves, disappeared from the record books of colonial America.